just to keep my mouth from spouting junk. Must have took me for a fool, cause they kicked me out of school, cause the teaching you I had the funk. But tonight I'm on the edge, better shut me in the fridge, cause I'm burning up, I'm burning up. With the beast still in my brains, and the rhythm in my veins, and the dirty music in my blood, and the messing with my heart, and the messing with my heart, won't stop messing with my heart, ripping, 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 ripping me apart. Hyperactive when I'm small, hyperactive now I'm grown, hyperactive and the night is long. Hyperactive in your phones, hyperactive in your bones, hyperactive when the day is young. <laughs> Favorites. Green giant hamster. 
Drink the giant hamster, right? Yeah? I believe there's a giant dormouse on the creek. But anyway, we'll take a look at them um, and we'll take a look at that in the sort of context of these reports of pygmy elephants. And whether the environment that they're in is anything like these islands in which the actual definitely existed fossil pygmy elephants existed.
Um, the forest elephant's range is this part here. It's about 7% of the range they had at the beginning of the 20th century. We think there's maybe definitely 40,000, possibly as many as 90,000. Uh, we really don't know how many there are. All populations of elephants all over the world, we're just hazarding a guess by dung. We're looking at the dung and there's some number crunching mathematical formulas from which we extrapolate how many elephants there are. We really don't have much of a clue. Um, so there's, as I say, the forest elephant. That's one from Gabon, where they're supposed to have slightly longer tusks than in pygmy elephants you find in other countries. So a big variation in elephants. If you wanted to hide unknown animals, this would be the place to do it. Very deep um, jungle. All right. So that's the known forest elephant. Um, my own view, and the view of many others, is that this 
which was called Loxodonta familiar, the Congo pygmy elephant, is actually some kind of phenomena among forest elephants whereby some of them in some way don't grow up, they've got some kind of pathological dwarfism, uh, some recessive gene that means there are individuals that don't grow up. And that's what it is. The zoological gardens, Surrey Zoological Gardens in London had a couple of them as well. Um, but these were small elephants that were under five foot. And um, round about what's now the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the Lake Leopold Lake, as it is then called, Lake Mindobe, several different types of pig elephant were showing up in the early 20th century. Uh, there was one that was, some remains were recovered by a man called Hans Schomburg. Uh, he was shown a piece of elephant eye which had his red fleecy hair. And there was also something called the Waka Waka by the locals, which was said to be a small elephant um, that liked water, its habitat for water and swamps. And it was described as having a slightly longer neck and a slightly shorter trunk. So around about the beginning of the 20th century, for a while, it was kind of accepted that there was this third type of elephant in West Africa. Um, I talked to Victoria Herridge, who's a paleontologist looking at pig elephants. She'd been to the Central African Museum in Ternova, just outside Brussels, where a lot of these skeletons are of pig elephants, and says they're, they're misidentified juveniles. Uh, how do you tell if the skeleton of an elephant is a baby or a fully grown small elephant. Like humans, you've got this part here that's fusing as you get older. There's these wiggly lines that gradually fuse. And also in some of the bones in your arms, which would be the front legs on an elephant. Um, but the problem is that they seem to keep, they're still fusing in, in your 40s if you're an elephant. So it's quite hard to look at the skull and say that's an adult or that's a juvenile. And it seems that some of these so-called pygmy elephant skulls in museums are, in fact, um, juveniles, possibly quite small individuals, but they're forest elephants. And some other morphological studies looking at the skulls have decided this as well. This is um, a photograph by Harold Nestroy. You can't get much more reputable than a witness. He was a man who was briefly in Billy Brown's cabinet in the German government in the 70s. He was a diplomat in Congo Brazzaville in 1982. Uh, he was on a hunt, yes, a, a legal elephant hunt. Then as now, there are legal elephant hunts in Congo Brazzaville with a £15,000 trophy fee payable to the government. And he was in a very remote part of Congo DR, the Likuda region. Um, you may remember Adam Davis's talk last year about the going for Mulikimobe, the, the putative dinosaur there. It's a very remote part of the world. Um, it's got the world's only dwarf crocodile about five foot long. So if you wanted to hide a pygmy elephant, that would be the place to do it. Anyway, he says, and he's quite an experienced hunter, that he saw these. This is, um, this is in colour. I'm afraid I haven't been able to get hold of a bigger photo. I am in touch with him, but he doesn't want to talk about it really. I think because he's, uh, He's now retired and he's doing a lot of charity work in Bhutan and doesn't like to be reminded of his... He was a quite keen hunter earlier, I think. Um, he saw these. Um, brown colour herd of elephants with sort of proportional young elephants. And possibly quite big ears. 
for uh, for ourselves. But they've got these normally smaller round radius. But uh, he was convinced that he'd seen a herd of smaller elephants. He said about five foot and fifty centimeters. You can't really see it in this slide, and we'll look at it in more detail later. But and this is another photograph. I'll show you that later. But he said that there is, you can see a cattle egret, which is a white bird, and he used that to make some sort of scale. And from that he said they're about five foot, 150 centimeters, which is at least a foot shorter than forest elephants are supposed to be. There's another photo um, in the same series, again this supposed herd of smaller elephants, which are a foot shorter than they're supposed to be. Uh, he also said that the same, or shortly afterwards, he saw another group of normal sized forest elephants, um, together with buffalo, so he could get some idea of the scale. Anyway, there's that sighting, which, which is supposed to be the recent sighting of smaller elephants. And based on his photograph, there's a sketch, which you couldn't really see on that slide, I'm sorry. Um, there's this cattle egret behind one of the adults, from which he got a scale of 150. Unless there are giant cattle egrets out there, which is a possibility. Um, since then, there's been a long study going on in a place called Zanga Clearing in the Central African Republic where big groups of forest elephants come together. And we're in the last two years of a 14 year study of their behaviour. And we found a few things out about their society that we didn't know when this photo was taken. The first is that uh, teenage elephants, particularly the males, tend to kind of form teenage gangs. And while they're still with this quite close family unit, the, the forest elephants have a smaller, tighter family than the big savannah elephants. Um, they do sort of hang around together for long periods. So it may be that what people have been seeing over the years is a big group of younger elephants. And the other thing we found out, that don't forget that this photo shows apparently smaller elephants with young, is that um, the savannah elephants, the ones that we studied more, given more um, attention to, because they were easy to study because they were in the open, uh, if the mother gets shot by poachers, which happens a lot, um, the calf almost never survives. But we've discovered recently that the forest elephant is different. That if the mother's poached, um, the calves do survive. And in fact, the young females, of course, of adolescent females, compete to adopt them. So it would be quite possible to see, um, as this might be. Um, that, that was a group of younger females who've adopted calves, so you know, the proportions would be different. Could be that. There's also these two puzzling photographs, not much information about them. Um, Liberia was president had his own zoo in the 70s, and he had a German veterinarian called Muller, I've only got one with Dr. Muller who took these photographs. It's rather difficult to uh, make anything from a photograph in which somebody is standing in front of the elephant. That could be Dr. Miller, I don't know. But he said he was regularly dealing with these, which are five foot elephants. Again, it's not a very good photo, and you can't tell much about it. It looks like it's quite a young elephant, like the sort of shape of the ears and the head. 
And there's another one, really not much you can tell from the quality of the photograph. He insisted he was regularly dealing with these five foot adult orange elephants, but I haven't got much information, not much we can tell about that. Oh, it didn't come out very well. Um, this is the Asian elephant, uh, Elephas maximus, slightly older evolutionary than the African elephant. Um, two to three meters is the, the mainland variant in India, what's called Elephas maximus indicus. It's a big range of Asian elephants across Asia, and there's a big variation between them. Um, the bigger ones are in Sri Lanka, so interestingly you've got on the island, the bigger ones. Uh, the males often don't have tusks, and in Sri Lanka they almost never have tusks. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I've included the, the baby ones to compare with um, some possible pygmy elephants we'll see later. Um, when they're young they've got wiry hair, like a mammoth, they've got tails reaching almost to the ground. And in all elephants, as they get bigger, the head gets slightly smaller. So, you know, is it a young elephant or is it a pygmy elephant? If the young elephant will have a big head, tail reaching to the ground. So this, is, this is a growth chart by uh, Sukarma, who is the expert on Indian elephants, about what they're supposed to look like. This is the chart that the wildlife conservation people and the forest rangers used determine uh, how an elephant is, as male elephants. A moment. If you go to Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Burma, where they've got a lot of wild elephants, they're a lot smaller. Um, and there seem to be 44 completely distinct populations across Asia which have no contact with each other now. <laughs> Within India, there's a lot, a lot of domestic elephants, uh, to the point where they're beginning to release them into the wild, where they can afford to. Um, and within Indian elephants, there's a big variation um, there's what they call two different castes of elephants. There's what they call kumalia, which is the big, stocky, barrel-shaped, well-proportioned one. And there's something called mriga, which is the kind of slender, delicate, lanky elephant. So, a vast um, variation in elephants in size and in build. And there's something called the kumki elephants, which they bring down from Tamil Nadu very specialised domestic elephant which they use to subdue or drive off wild elephants when they're bothering people. There's a whole kind of elephant spotting science, a bit like wine appreciation. That's the range of elephants. Um, that's the most recent one we've got, 1995. Um, elephant surveys take a long time, so they're, they're not very up to date. So 1986 is the most recent survey, comprehensive survey of elephant numbers that we've got for forest elephants. There's, there's been a general elephant survey in Africa done last year. But what's interesting, looking at India, you can see there are these completely isolated populations within India. So something like a hundred little enclaves of elephants that have no contact with each other. So, theoretically, no way that there's any kind of genetic interchange going on between the elephants there. So, could this be some kind of island forest in which um, small elephants could develop? We'll take a look at that.
Um, Veron Serbar, which is the northern tip of Borneo, that's Malaysian territory, and they go a little bit into Indonesia. Not very many left, maybe 1,500. And they've got this very characteristic, sort of slightly sad, slightly comic face, um, ever so slightly bigger ears, and ever so slightly bigger heads. Now, the fossil pygmy elephants, as they got smaller, had big heads. Interesting. And you may think pygmy elephants are cute. But that is a big beast. That is at least six foot tall. You know, couldn't go for a walk in the park with that. And interestingly, the World Wildlife Fund, who are promoting wildlife tourism, again, not a very good slide, that's their own scale, and they've got the Asian elephant, the mainland elephant from India, and the Borneo elephant, about the same size. So, really not much bigger than a, a mainstream Asian elephant. However, what's very interesting is they did some mitochondrial DNA research on them and they found that they've been developing in isolation for 300,000 years. So they've been a unique population for a very long time, long before people came along. So it looks as if they were developing in isolation, slightly small elephants on an island. But then this year, um, the Sarawak Museum did some archaeological digging around, looked at the archaeological evidence, and they found that there's no archaeological evidence for elephants on the island before 1700. And it seems that, also there was no reports coming from the explorers who arrived in the area in the 16th century of elephants. If you're a Western explorer in the 16th century and you arrive somewhere, I think you probably mentioned elephants, if there were any. But they found that, um, well, what they concluded was that there was a population of elephants on, belonging to the, the southern of, Borne, of uh, Sula and North Borneo. Sula is in the bottom of the Philippines archipelago, where it's closest to Indonesia, not far from Sarawak, where the Indonesian archipelago begins. And there was an elephant diplomacy going on on the pairs of elephants been given to rulers and it seems that the Sultan of Borneo in Sula either brought as gifts um, oh, oh, sorry, was given uh, as gifts um, a pair of elephants which either swam or were shipped to North Borneo. North Borneo is no longer part of the Sultan of Sula and it seems that's where they came from. So it now looks as if these elephants came from another island archipelago where they died out. Um, and then have gone wild on Borneo. But on the archipelago where they came from, they've been developing in isolation for a very long time. Juvenile male elephants from the 
Forest Ranger Handbook. Um, not a very good image at this scale, you can't really conclude much. The ears seem a little bigger, and he doesn't seem to have proportionally such a big head as the baby elephant. I don't know, but it's hard to tell at that scale. Um, there are some people uncharitably who say it looks rather like a young Borneo elephant, and that's in fact what it is. But they just use the photo of a Borneo elephant. Uh, he says he took this photo in the uh, Papara Wildlife Sanctuary, and it's one of those good cryptozoological fortune principles asked the locals. He was guided there by the local tribal peoples, a group called the Kani, who have 13 settlements in the park. And they've long had this um, tradition that there are these pygmy elephants. These small elephants, about five foot high, very shy, avoid the other type of elephant, even though they live in the same area. Um, and they scramble over the stones, they've got these little legs that can take them over the stones, and they, they're quite fast. Apparently they run quite fast, which is why they've got this name, which means the dragonfly. Uh, while this tradition's been around for a long time, and, and the local people of Kerala um, talk about it too, I had a look at some of the expatriate blogs from the people from Kerala who speak a language called Malayalam, as the bottom of Exeter. Um, but when they're talking about back home, they're all mentioning this story they heard when they were kids and they got this Kalama. Um, and some of the wildlife people, some of the, the rangers in the park, the forest service, seem to take it quite seriously. But interestingly, they got more interested in it after the, they read about on the internet about the Borneo pygmy elephant being given this special status. The wildlife sanctuary where this photo was taken is, is not an island forest, and a lot of people pointed out that it's a, a national park where the normal size elephants are wandering around, and it's got predators, it's got tigers. It's quite near a place called the Pal Gap, Gap um, which is, there was a recent Columbia University genetic study about looking at the, the DNA of normal sized um, Asian elephants, and they seem to have two distinctive genetic populations, and near the Gap, where those two populations diverge, which is could be important. Uh, the Kerala Forest Department, they take this elephant seriously enough. They put together an expedition to go out for it this year. But unfortunately, uh, the rains were heavier than expected and they were rained off. But they were going out to look for it. They were out in an expedition. They were looking for dung to take DNA samples. Um, bad weather forced them back. And yeah, they did another expedition in 1995, also looking for dying or evidence this elephant. So, um, certainly, locally, the possibility that there's a small elephant out there is taken quite seriously. Sari uh, Padole, sorry, Padole, I'm sorry, the, um, the man of the picture, uh, ruled out the possibility that it was a group of um, calf elephants. He said they're not known to move in herds of their own. But uh, Sukuma, the, the expert on the Indian Wildlife Service, state expert on elephants, he's saying that uh, he doesn't believe that it was surreal because he says that he's encountered um, groups of Asian elephant teenage gangs. So there's male teenage elephants who move together in gangs for a short while and then go back to the family. And that's what he says um, the photographer saw. He talks about young bachelor groups of elephants, and he certainly knows his elephants. It's interesting that the, um, in Liberia they recently discovered in the camera trap the pygmy hippo, which they thought had been killed by the Civil War, um, alive and well in quite a similar environment 
deep forest where there was a need to run away from predators. <laughs> so you know, they could be could be the same sort of environment. There's also this um, archaeological evidence. Um, this is the tomb of Rekhmi Ray, means wiser than God. He was the Grand Vizier, the most important official in ancient Egypt in Thebes. There's his tomb. These are about two foot high, these drawings. And there's this intriguing thing here. You can see it there. I'll look at it in more detail. This is uh, the Syrians bringing tribute. They were a trading nation with Egypt. And if you look at the giraffe, it's a very accurate giraffe there. And the bears are accurate. And then there's this strange elephant which has tusks. And there's also um, other people carrying adult tusks which are much bigger. These are drawings, not very clear, I'm afraid, um, made by the Metropolitan Museum of Art of the, the same tombs. Just for a while, I hope that they were clearer. Um, there's the elephant again. A lot of this has worn away. And the way they interpreted the drawing, because there was a lot of it missing, a lot of the, the painting just peeled off. But um, they seem to think that the tusks were behind the head. They weren't coming out of sockets like they were supposed to, but they were sort of put in behind the head. And um, we know that the, although it's very accurate animals here, which you would have seen, that you got a lot of it wrong. There's this group of Minoans bringing tribute, and they went over and did the loincloths again because they got them wrong. And some of the colours on the birds are wrong that they're guessing. Um, there were elephants in very ancient Egypt, but by the time this was done, they were only known on some little hieroglyph. There was a, a hieroglyph symbol that was an elephant. So we think that the painter wasn't there. He seems to have been copying the style of other two paintings. And he may have been confused about what he was drawing. Um, you've got the adult tusks there. But if you look at his legs, a bit kind of lanky, I think that's a baby. I think that's a baby elephant. And the person who painted that wasn't sure whether they had tusks or not because he hadn't actually seen them. Although some of the pink elephants of the Mediterranean or about sea did have big heads and very curved tusks. Now I personally think that's a baby. If any zookeepers can tell me whether that's a baby giraffe or an adult giraffe scaled down, interesting to know. Also, in the 19th century, if you look at engravings of these giant animal markets in Eritrea, um, they're shipping baby elephants, they're not shipping adults, because it's a lot easier. through some of the um, known fossil pig elephants from the fossil record. This is from Tenos in Greece, that's in the Paleontology, Paleontology Museum in Athens. To scale up with a pygmy hippo, also from Tenos Island in Greece. So that was the last of the Mediterranean pygmy elephants when the first humans turned up. There are also controversial bones that suggest that the last humans may have finished them off, but nobody wants to go on the record about that yet. As you can see, that was quite a big beast because you've got three people moving the fiberglass model into the museum. Uh, it did share space with a smaller pink elephant that was more like three foot. We'll take a look at that. 
This is Eliphaz Fulconiri, one of the smallest ones. I'm sorry that slide is upside down. Um, Barrel meter high, one of the smallest ones, 800,000 years ago, as small as known pig elephant. To be reconstructed with these very curvy tusks. Um, quite a big head it had. I don't know if you can see it, but that's to scale with his ancestor, which is a sort of bigger version of the Asian elephant called um, Elephas Antiquus, and it's a lot smaller, about less than a third of size. These elephants seem to have got their by swimming, um, and there were lots of different waves of elephants. There'd be elephants that arrived, they evolved smaller, and then later waves arrived that were bigger, they also start to evolve smaller sizes. And it's quite a confusing picture, um, because also the pygmy elephants evolved what we call pygmomorphic features, sort of child-like features. As they got smaller, the heads got bigger and the teeth got simpler. So they look more like juvenile elephants anyway, so it became harder to tell what was a genuine adult pygmy elephant and what was a juvenile. And to make things even more complicated, there seemed to be a lot of what we call sexual dimorphism. The males were a lot bigger than females, so what we think were species weren't actually species, it was just a female version of another one. So there's a quite jumbled picture of um, the elephants of the Mediterranean. That's a baby which would have been about the size of a large cat. I went to see it at the Natural History Museum, they had a milk tusk. You know, children have milk teeth, these have milk tusks. And it's like one of those short pencils they give you at the cat, they're very small indeed. This is in a museum in Germany, this is another of these Edifas Falconeri, the smallest ones. They've reconstructed them with these quite bent legs, but I'm not sure about that. Um, this is backstage at the Natural Museum, these elephants from Malta, that's a complete adult tusk. These are the humeruses, this part, of adults. And there's a 19th century drawing of the original ancestor, and they're getting progressively smaller, different versions of, later versions of different species of increasingly small elephant. This is a Cypriot pig elephant. Again, the, the Bate collection, Dorothea Bate was a great naturalist who collected lots of these. These are complete molars, teeth, um, the human hand scale. By comparison, the Indian and the Asian ones would be a sort of brick, brick, brick block size, so they're quite a lot smaller. The ones from Cyprus, um, there's now seems to be a bit more evidence that they may have actually evolved from mammoths that swam there and got smaller. But again, um, the reports I'm getting about these people don't want to actually go on the record and say that yet. But the speculation that these may have evolved from mammoths, some of them. Indonesia, Sulawesi, around there. Um, there was a variation on the elephants called the Stegodon. This has got very different teeth. That's a stegodon tooth, a modern African and Asian elephant. There was a, a big variety of elephants that swam to the Indonesian archipelago and started to get smaller. Some of them were descendants of these stegodons, and there's this other one, Elephas celebrensis, which seems to have been possibly descended from an elephant, not a stegodon. Again, quite a confusing picture. Remember there was the discovery of Homo florensis, these putative hobbit-like men, which is a bit controversial. Uh, the people around at that time in Indonesia may have hunted these pygmy elephants. We now think they hunted the juvenile version of another bigger elephant. Uh, there's a book coming out next year by some Dutch paleontologists that will hopefully clear up some of that. But as you can see, all over the world you've got Elephants swimming to islands, and because there's a shortage of food, no predators, they lose their massive size, get progressively smaller. There's a pygmy mouth. Um, you can just about see this 14 foot ancestor, and there it is, about six foot high. This is from the Channel Islands, not off the coast of France, but off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. And there were these, this one is five foot high in the Santa Barbara Museum, pygmy mammoths. We do 
unchanged for a very long time. And it looks like the Chamish Indians, the first humans to arrive, finished them off about 13,000 years ago. Um, finally, the last one of the fossil record examples. That's a mammoth, not a particularly well restored one. I think the legs are a bit dodgy. Um, the Tamir Peninsula, the last of the mammoths. Um, the last mammoth died back, we think, about 4,500 years ago. There was some in Wrangell Island in the north of Siberia, and this region of Siberia known as the Tamir Peninsula. And as they died out more and more, they ended up living in these isolated pockets of mammoths. And the awful lot of mammoth remains that we found from around there. So much so that Russia started an industry of exporting mammoth tusks again as an industry, because there are so many of them. And because there are so many, there's been a lot of studying of the remains, and it seems that as mammoths got more and more scarce, and were living on these pockets of where there were still mammoths. Um, it would be controversial to say that they became smaller, but they're noticing what they call a, a bigger proportion of diminutive individuals. So proportionally more of the mammoths from that period as time progresses get smaller. So it seems to be the same sort of evolutionary forces. Isolated pockets of mammoths in this environment getting smaller. Going back to the, um, the Congo King Elephant again, um, a lot of the explorers from the beginning of the 20th century around Congo were told there were three kinds of elephants, and they assumed that the third was this smaller pygmy elephant. That's what the locals are telling them. But um, there was a surprising, another mitochondrial DNA study done a couple of years ago of forest elephants. And they found that a large number, possibly half, of the ones they surveyed had the mitochondrial DNA, the DNA of their mother was a forest elephant, the nuclear DNA of their father was a savannah elephant. And an awful lot of them were hybrids. That the savannah elephants, the bigger ones, were breeding with the forest elephants, because the forest elephants aren't in the forest all the time, they move out into Savannah and move back. And there seemed to be entire populations where everyone was a hybrid Savannah and forest elephant, and some were saying we need to talk about a different species. Um, but it may be that when the locals were telling these people there's a third kind of elephant, what they meant was that there's a sort of hybrid elephant. There's, there's a whole population where everyone's a hybrid, and there's been hybridized for some time, but that could be possible. Um, sadly, it is also entirely possible that there was a pygmy elephant at the beginning of the 20th century, and there isn't any more, because that was at the time of the Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad, where there was a wholesale extermination of elephants going on, mostly for ivory billiard balls, and they were being decimated. And then there was the crash 1914 of the ivory industry and elephant numbers began to recover and then in the 70s there was the Asian consumer boom and there was a big demand for ivory seals that people used to sign letters in particular in China and Japan and there was a second wave of decimation of elephants, particularly forest elephants and then again with the, the wars we've seen in uh, Congo with some very desperate people. Um, and apparently 40,000 automatic rifles coming into the country. And with war, all the industry and agriculture collapsing. It's quite possible there was a big elephant population, or there was a population of smaller elephants, which just, it's just been wiped out. It's been destroyed by automatic weapons and it isn't there anymore. Or possibly it was displaced by all these poachers moving in and bred out into the bigger population. Um, there was a clearing that was discovered quite by chance in the north of the Congo by the US Fish and Wildlife on a reconnaissance flight a couple of years ago. Uh, it lately didn't even know it existed, and they found 200 corpses of elephants killed by automatic weapons over two years. 
and there's been a similar mass um, killing field for elephants discovered in China recently. So I'm afraid it's quite possible that the people in the beginning of the 20th century who described congregating elephants were right. But they've all gone. Island forests, island dwarves, island giants. Um, as we saw earlier, there are these little islands where there are still elephants in India. Koralas around here, the uh, Papara sanctuary be around here. And like islands, island forests seem to develop these dwarves and giants. That's the giant Sengu discovered this year, twice the size of most shoes. And you can see some examples here. So it could be that the same evolutionary forces that produce islands towards the pigment on islands do so in island forests. Although, as we've seen with the elephant in Karaba, uh, they say that it's not actually an island forest. Okay. Any questions? Okay, who's my brother about it? Greg, my brother about it. They were the forest elephants. Um, they, were, they were in the forest elephants, and there was one battle where um, the Ptolemaic Egyptians came up against the Indian elephants of the Seleucids, battle of Rathia, and were soundly beaten by the much bigger um, Asian elephants, the Indian elephants. Um, there have been two attempts since then by the Belgians to the Belgian Congo to tame. Forest elephants. The first one was an absolute massacre, but they went out and orphaned a lot of them to order. Um, it was pretty horrible. And then they brought in Mahouts of India, who advised them to follow a big herd and wait till they left a few behind by accident. And they took in those orphans and managed to train them to work. But with the sort of collapse of the Belgian Empire in the late 40s, that was abandoned. There's also a project in um, South Africa using orphaned elephants to work as mounts for wildlife service people to carry them around using savannah elephants. So it has been done in modern times as well. Any other questions? Rona? I had your question as an observation because I'm a full of knowledge. Um, with regard to Hannibal, I believe at least one of the elephants was an Asiatic elephant. And if you bear in mind that he came from Carthage, which was a Phoenician colony, if he'd have been trading with the Syrians, and uh, Asiatic elephants were common in Syria way back in those days. Yeah, the, the, the Syria, Syria had um, Asian elephants at the time. I believe the Egyptian army had two of them too. Uh, a lot of the ivory that was being imported into the Mediterranean in Greek times was from Syria as well, or traded from Syria. There was some kind of Ethiopian elephant capturing and training station for the Roman army in Ethiopia, and they had specialist elephant hunting troops that they used. But yeah, they'd be using both um, Asian and um, African elephants in, in ancient times. Any other questions? Again, it's not a question, it's an observation. In Egyptian art, it is almost certain that the tomb painter would have been working from a sketch, a, a drawing, which was probably by someone else. It would be too good to think that the man who got to do the paintings in the tomb had observed all those things firsthand. So the possibility of misinterpretation is quite strong. But I would also say that um, the Egyptians are fairly alert to issues of scale. So if the elephant is that small, it's a small elephant.